Good morning. Is it on? I was hoping more would show up with it being cold weather, bring them out of bed. <laughs> uh, we're glad to have everybody here. And number one announcement I'm going to slide in is November 14th, we've decided on for the Thanksgiving dinner here at the church. And we'll provide meats and y'all provide the sides. <laughs> and desserts. And desserts, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to be more of one until diabetes came on. <laughs> Heaven will be a wonderful place. Yeah. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to have uh, worship at 9 o'clock, coffee and co conversation, Sunday school to follow, and worship at 10.50, and then a worship committee meeting at 5 o'clock. And anybody's welcome to come to that worship committee meeting. And uh, Halloween will meet the same time, and uh, y'all enjoy trick or treating in the evening. We're not doing anything Halloween night. <laughs> uh, y'all want to join me in the gathering song? We gather together, 276, in your hymnal. Would you join us in the call to worship and the responsive reading, please? Praise the Lord, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, who is good and whose steadfast love endures forever. Who can the mighty name of the Lord or declare the free act God is due? Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them. Let us worship God. And now's the time for the Sorry. I'm sorry. The re, uh, responsive reading prayer is whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, all. Oh God, are your, you and our praises and tell you of your virtues in the midst of our neighbors. Your commandments are just. They give us de direction. Your co covenant encompasses us in Christ and knits us together. We give you all honor as we rejoice in your glory. Amen. Amen. Will the children please come forward for the children's moment?
so much Christy those are beautiful beautiful songs so Nick again I was visiting with a lady in our grief share group she's a pianist and she said do y'all still need a pianist at the church <laughs> and I said well I said no not anymore <laughs> I said we kind of have gotten spoiled and uh, we kind of like the videos now so no nah. I said don't don't look for one real fast because we kind of like these videos a lot you do a good job Christy and I appreciate that before we get to our prayer list, I do have one other announcement to be able to share with you. Why don't you in introduce our guest, the two young men that are with you? Samuel? Benjamin and Samuel. Very good to meet you all. The guys you're here today, I'm Jimmy. Glad that y'all are with us. Look forward to y'all being with us often. There is a further announcement. I, I, I know uh, you may have heard about it, Sarah. I'm not sure. The uh, group is that we're gathering some goods yes. to take over. Do you want to say something about that? Um, actually, let me tell you, this is uh, uh, from Connection Church. Yes. Yes. And if you want to bring some of those supplies, I'm going to be going for sure. I'm sure perhaps you are too, Sarah. But uh, if you want to bring those supplies that morning, if you're not able to go, I'll make sure that we carry them out there. So they're cleaning and hygiene supplies for the refugees. 
well carry them out there for them because it's after the worship service so if you can go go with us if you can't go then just bring your supplies and we'll make sure we carry them out there so along so so along with those that prayer request let's join into our other prayer requests our own church and our sister churches of course, the community in Louisiana continues to recover, and we want to make bless, ask blessing for that. Paula Smith did get out of uh, the rehab and went home, and she sounded real good over the phone. I got to talk to her over the phone. Actually, I went to the rehab, and she was gone. So, uh, But I had business over in Midland anyway, and so I just went ahead and went by the rehab to see her. But she had already been dismissed, so she got out pretty quick, and has gone back home, and that's great. Yeah, Claire. Y'all going to go check it out, the doctor? You're going to give her a few days. Yeah. 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 Give it a little time first. I did get to also talk with Collinsworth. They were out of town, but you want to continue to remember them in prayer and at Dakota in particular. But if you gets doing really good, every time I go over and visit with her, she's sitting up and is doing good. We had a good conversation this last week, and so please remember her in prayer. Larry Myers family, that funeral was yesterday at First Presbyterian Church, was well attended, had a good group there for the funeral, and it went very well, but please continue to remember their family in prayer. And then remember the uh, uh, Presley family, Coach Presley, you know, here he was honored even this last week, but his wife became one of my patients this last week also, and she died the uh, day before yesterday, and I'm going to be doing that memorial service on Thursday at the funeral home. So please remember the press, Coach Presley and the rest of the family in prayer. All right, anybody else that you want to remember in particular? We've got a long list here of people. Don't forget all these people that are on the list. Baron Moore, as well as all of those who are Gail Kinney, of course, and she continues to deal with her health one step at a time. Grateful for today. I always do the way we get up and grateful for my health also. I want to say thank you for praying for me because I'm getting better all the time. Part of that getting better, my wife gets frustrated at it because I'll come in and put my oxygen on and sit down in the chair and start watching TV. And she'll come in and she'll say, you know, Jimmy, that's not doing you a lot of good. And I said, what's that? She said, you didn't turn the machine on. <laughs> so I, apparently I'm doing much better. Because <laughs> I forget to turn the machine on. Remember Jody in prayer, she's on the road today. She went to see Cindy in, uh, in Lubbock. Anybody else? All right, let's join our hearts together in prayer and, of course, conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we love you so very much, and we do pray for all these that are on our prayer list. Opportunity that we have in sharing with them, we thank you for that opportunity for us being a conduit of encouragement and support. Lord Jesus, we pray that you continue to do that through us. Use us as your servants as best you can and as best we can. And then, Father, we pray also for the unspoken prayer request that all of us have. We give them to you and ask humbly that your help might be instilled there too, Lord Jesus. We love you. Make this week a good one as we get on to it. And help us, Lord, as we minister to one another and to those in our community. Now, even as you've taught us to pray, we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing together.
is free. When we have been blind to the needs of others, you have opened our eyes. When we have been low in spirit, you have lifted us up. When we have been hungry, you have been given us bread. Let the bread of communion remind us, O oh God, that you provide for our deepest needs, that in the presence of Jesus Christ, we have found our nourishment and strength. Help us remember, gracious God, that you have met our needs. It is for a purpose. You want us to be with your people, bringing freedom, life, hope, and the bread to the world around us as, as ambassadors of Christ. Amen. Take and eat. With the opportunity of having the creativity that we have, that uh, Christy's given us, we're also learning something else. Now, I know I noted, if you've noted, that is that um, in Christianity, it is so very old that uh, songs change words through the years. And so you think that you're going to be singing a hymn that has the old traditional words and it ends up having all three songs today had different words than what I was used to. And, but that's a good thing because you're exposed to different things. And that's an important thing as well that we get to get a little uh, new experience. And that's new experiences in the way in which those songs have changed and the words have changed through the years. I want to uh, return again to a series of sermons. And of course, I was taught a long time ago in, in uh, preaching class never to tell people that you're preaching a series of sermons because... They say, well, I just won't come then. <laughs> no, don't do that. I, 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 uh, you're experienced churchmen, all of you here today, and so I can risk that in telling you that we're going to return to that series of sermons, Milestones, that I stopped and went to a different series, and why God decided that, I don't know, but it just turned my mind to that other series, and it was a good one. This one, of course, is looking at those stones that are on the, those benches, 
and the characteristics that are on those benches at uh, West Point Academy on the hill overlooking the Hudson River and the uh, parallel between those characteristics and the characteristics of being a believer of growing as a believer and they are there we've been looking at a couple of them already and one of those I talked about love and compassion being the characteristic the crucifixion of Jesus is the example of that and the milestone is birth you and I are born again one of the milestones of our lives is birth that's a milestone a great milestone that we'll often over, uh, overlook but all of us are born and that birth characteristics characterizes our lives some people are born with disabilities I was born with a disability with a murmur in my heart and I had to deal with that all of my life it changed my life completely all of my life has been characterized by that eventually going to enter seminary I was required to get another physical. I'd played football here in Odessa and run track and done all those things that you do, but that murmur, my father basically just kind of forgot about it. After my mother died, he quit taking me to the doctor about it because he decided he had four boys already. The loss of one was not a big deal. So he decided just to forget about it, and so I didn't do anything about it. But that physician, when I had my physical, I was surprised. I was just really in a hurry to get to seminary and after college. And he said, not so fast. He said, you've got something wrong inside of you. And I said, you know, Jesus has been telling me that all my life. Something wrong inside of me. It's called sin. He didn't think that was funny. And he said, well, no, Jimmy, you have something wrong inside of you. You have a heart problem. And I said, uh, <laughs> you know, like, we all have heart problems, but Jesus changes that. <laughs> Very evangelical Baptist back then. Did he really? But he came back, didn't he? He's fine right now. Yeah, he recovered. So did I. So did I. That physician said, you know, before you go to seminary, I'm going to put you in the hospital and you have to have catheterization. I have to look at that valve because it's not working right. And he did, and he went ahead and had me, but he said, you know, we don't have good technique right now. I am a guy. <laughs> And that was young. I just got out of college. And he said, we don't have real excellent techniques right now when it comes to heart surgeries. But he said, we are developing some new techniques. And he said, we'll get there. So he said, don't do surgery now. But he said, before you get to 50, or about the time you get to 50, you're going to have to have surgery. I forgot about it and just moved on. Driving a school bus for Fort Worth, I got pulled out of line several times because you had to have a physical in order to drive a school bus. Thankfully, I want to make sure the school bus drivers are healthy enough that they're not going to die at the wheel. And he pulled me out of line several times. He said, you've got something different inside of you. I wanted to make the same kind of wrong. I was first getting on. And so uh, he thought about it. And I was like, that's what? I'm going to go ahead and crash. You've and you've run track and done all You're driving the school bus, so I'll let you drive the school bus. And I still have my chauffeur's license. I keep it. And every year I have to get a check. I have to do it every year. It costs me $75 every year. I have to go get my heart checked again. I got a friend physician that does it for me, and he just basically checks it all off. But I have to get it checked again in order to keep that chauffeur's license. So they'll take it away from me. Well, birth does funny things to us, doesn't it? Birth can change your whole life. And it changed my whole life. My whole life has been characterized by that heart difficulty. And it will, until I die, still be a change that has taken place. Crucifixion changed our lives. Crucifixion changed everything about me and everything about you. We learned love and compassion through what Jesus did. The second one was that there is the great milestone of finding the best job you've ever had. You finally find that. If you're really looking for it and if you're called to the profession that you have, you finally find the best job you've ever had. And you do the best work that you've ever done in that job. We learn purpose. Purpose. Having purpose is an important thing. And basically that purpose is reflected in the body of Christ, the church. When Jesus said, you are the church, you're going to go forward. I'm not through with the world. Though I have been crucified, resurrected, and I'm going to be at the right-hand side of the Father, 
I'll be with you always, but I want you to keep going. Go unto Jerusalem and Samaria and tell the story. Do this until I come back. You'll continue to struggle with the world in sharing the gospel. Well, now we come to another milestone. And the passage I want to read comes out of Ephesians chapter 4. Let me read that passage. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him the accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your former way of life, to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. A strong personality characteristic that leads us to establish the milestone of high school graduation. That's a milestone, wasn't it? High school graduation. Uh, where Herb is today is he went to uh, her grad school, high school reunion. And he texted me by mistake. He does that a lot. Oh, I get lots of mistakes from Herb. And, uh, and the mistake was, he, he said, oh, he, when I called him, I said, Herb, are you looking for me? And he said, oh, Jimmy, I'm sorry. I, I texted you by mistake. He said, I'm down here. We're at this high school graduation, our high school reunion. And he said, so far, seven have shown up. <laughs> and he said, I guess that's good. <laughs> I don't know. When Sue comes back, I'll ask her how it went. You know, with seven, seven returning. I guess this is their 60th, I guess. Maybe our 70th. You know, reunion. And it, is it, it was at uh, uh, Grand Falls? Imperial. Yeah, Imperials. Uh, Buena Vista High School. Seven, seven have returned. Well, that's a good thing. Well, high school graduation is a milestone. And you have to have a will to do it. You have to establish that will. It's easy not to. It's easy to drop out. Excellence must become a habit. If you want to excel at something, you have to keep doing it over and over again. If you don't, you fall out of that. I dedicated my dissertation when I finished my doctorate. I wrote my dissertation. A good friend of mine, Dr. Lyndall Harris. He was a missionary in Hawaii and sick and had to be back to the States. And they gave him a job as head of the Bible Department at Arkansas University. And he would became a very good friend of mine. And he cared about me. And uh, I'd never had a teacher really care for me the way that he cared for me. I was working full time at Wolf Nursery and pastoring a church on the side. And so I was busy all the time and going to school full time. Trying to do all those things. If you did that, you know what it's like. You just don't have time for the things that you really need to spend time with. And I had him for two classes. One was the theology of Paul and was for was and with the other was the life of Jesus. And so he asked me in both of those classes to write a paper. All of us had to write one. Well, I fudged. I was taught how to write a research paper, but I didn't have time. And so I wrote a five-page research paper on Paul's doctrine of sin and upon Jesus teaching about baptism. I wrote a five-page paper on it. He started class after I turned that paper, both those papers in, and I came to class that morning. He started class, and after he had gone through the role, he said, uh, Jimmy Braswell, I want to see you in the hallway. And I thought, you can't do this. This is college. You can't call me out into the hallway. I'm not, I, this isn't high school. You know, you can't do this. And I got up, what's going on? I have to go out in the hallway. I'm in college. I'm an adult. <laughs> he got me out there, and he pinned me up again. He said, Jim, put his finger in my face. He said, both papers you turned in are not worthy of the information that you were supposed to research. You can do better than this. I know you can. He said, here's both papers. You will redo both of these papers. I'm not going to grade them, otherwise I'm going to flunk you. 
I'm giving you a chance to redo these papers. Man, I was... But I tell you what, the reason why I dedicated my research paper, my dissertation, to believe in myself, fudge anymore. To do my best not to think that I can get by on just a little bit, but to do my best on every piece of work that I did in school. A will to do it. Our health, both physical and emotionally, is improved and sustained in direct proportion to our ability to show, as a matter of daily habit, self-discipline and balance, to balance our lives, to balance what we're doing. Balance is especially important in the will that you and I have to do what we need to do. Our fear can cause us to exaggerate it. You can do too much. That same professor once during class or during a lecture that was going on, he had dismissed our class to go to a lecture that was taking place, and the lecturer wanted to try to encourage us, and he said, you know, all of you students, if you don't make an A in every class, you're failing Jesus. And you need to be making an A in every class. That professor, my favorite professor, got up and he said, I'm going to correct that. He said, you don't have to make an A but you have to do your best. And he said, I want you to know that some of you C students, and you look right at me, some of my C students are some of the best students I have because you're trying hardest you can. Just do your best. Be willful enough to do your best, and that will be enough in serving Jesus. I appreciated that from him, and I've never forgotten it because you can overdo it. You can become an overachiever. Being an overachiever, you can become a perfectionist and demand that perfection from everybody. And people just don't all have that perfection. People are not perfect. It can become a veil of obscurity between us and God, demanding that perfection. You ever met somebody who actually believes that they are perfect about everything? And you, you want to tell them, you know, you're really not. You know, but they, they, they just believe it so much you hate to disappoint them. You know, because they really believe that they're perfect. They believe that everything that they do is exactly as everybody else should do it. They are overachievers. Well, discipline on one of the benches on that hill overlooking West Point is an important characteristic. The discipline and the willfulness to balance your freedom. Sylvanius Thayer, he was the class of 1808, is called under his statue the father of the military academy. He was responsible for rescuing that school from disorder and chaos. It was a terrible place to attend. West Point was early in its years. He instituted educational standards and military discipline into it that made it become the good school. His first assignment after graduation was to build as a construction engineer for Warren in Boston Harbor. But he was appalled when he began his job at the poor performance and unpreparedness of many of his officers. They were just not prepared for the job, and they were undisciplined in their job. He believed it was because of the poor substandard educational and training discipline that they received at West Point. Leadership was poor, and discipline was non-existent on campus then. Their library consisted of one shelf. The library, the entire library of West Point was one shelf of books. He was sent by President Madison to France to study academics and to purchase a library. President Madison gave him $5,000, which was a lot of money back then, to go to Europe, to France, and to purchase a library for West Point. He cherished the opportunity because his hero was Napoleon, and he wanted to go and study Napoleon anyway, and so he went to Europe to study President Monroe eventually appointed him as the new superintendent of West Point. Why? Because the old superintendent had to be arrested and removed. Yeah, of West Point. He took over. Most of the cadets were AWOL. He could only find 40 of them. That's all he could find. The rest of them were AWOL because they'd been commissioned. His personal habits were to be well-dressed, punctual, and disciplined. That newly appointed Colonel Thayer, he impli implied new rules. You must maintain physical fitness. He um, instituted demerits for uh, misbehavior, and he instituted military dress for classrooms. 
a revolt resulted. People revolted against him. He said, decided that all students were going to be equal. And, and during that revolt, several wealthy students, their families, funded some revolt against him. But he was given by Congress the power to court-martial offenders. And so he started court-martialing some of the cadets at West Point, totally dis disgracing them. He established that all students would be considered equal. They could not receive money from home. He hired an excellent group of professors. He himself had a great memory, and he memorized the students' names, and he had memorized their families so that when he greeted them on campus, he would ask how their families were. One of his students was Edgar Allan Poe, one of the students at the military academy. Though he eventually dropped out, <laughs> he was liked by Thayer. And Thayer and the student body eventually helped him publish his first book of poems. Though he eventually, too, was court-martialed. Edgar Allan Poe, he was court-martialed for drunkenness and for selling black market items on campus. I don't know if you knew that about his history. But uh, they liked each other, and they became lifelong friends there and Edgar Allan Poe. During President Jackson's presidency, when the rich could buy politics, he was uh, awarded the opportunity to lead West Point in all of its matters, and he got in trouble with those families. They were trying to get favors. They had asked President Jackson who sold favors, by the way. He, they were getting favors for those students to get their military appointments. Well, there resigned. He eventually was restored after Jackson's tenure, and he was honored for bringing order to the institution out of anarchy. And it became then that true standard of military training and discipline that it is even today. It's been valued in the United States ever since. The day before his retirement, President Lincoln promoted him to be a brigadier general. And so Thayer went had his place in history. How do you balance freedom and discipline? Well, Thayer learned how to do it and passed it on to the students that discipline became important. Number one is to build good habits. He encouraged diet and exercise, to be on time, to make good choices in the smallest of matters. To be on time, that's an important thing. Some people are always early. Some people are too early. But to be on time is a significant thing. To finish what you started. When I made a dedication of my life to become a minister, I was 14. It was over at Sherwood Baptist Church, just across town, that I asked, I went forward and told the pastor that I believed that God was calling me to ministry. Uh, the brother of my best friend, who lives just, or he used to live just around the corner, spent a lot of time with them. He came down and was shaking hands with me, and while a lot of other people just did that in the traditional way of shaking hands, he stopped as he shook my hand, and he said, Jimmy, you start today. If he is calling you to ministry, it's not one of these days that you're going to do that. You start today in serving him. I've never forgotten that. He's been a lifelong friend. seems like that same balance was illustrated for us in the Lord Jesus when the Lord Jesus was facing the crucifixion, Gethsemane, because he showed us that balance of freedom and discipline, which is will. Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The balance of freedom and discipline is true, strong will. We may not always get things the way that we wanted them, but we follow what God puts in our laps. Whatever God has sent our way, that's what we accept. Whatever he has given us to do, we become good at it. Flee temptation. If you fail, forgive yourself and start again. Find mentors, role models. That's what the title of deacon and elder is actually represented in the scripture. These are people who are role models. These are people to look up to. These are people to you to look to and to find some encouragement from and then last, the scripture tells us that we are made new. Be made new in the attitude of your mind 
and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and true holiness. I want to close with the fact that it was, it was illustrated also in the story of Adam and Eve. In the story of Adam and Eve, they had the chance to choose what they wanted to do and they made a bad choice. In their will, they chose their own freedom. Well, I want my freedom. I want to do what I want to do. Now, does that remind you that all of us have it inside of us? When we say you have the nature of sin, as the, the Baptists will tell us, you have that nature of sin inside of you. No, we have a natural inclination to it. The natural inclination is to do what I want to do. I want what I want. I don't want what you want. Jesus showed us that that is true in all kinds of humanity, in him being fully human, but you and I must transcend that with the will of saying, what you want, God. I will what you want. Not what I want, but what you want. You and I were given another chance in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. From that sinful state, we're given another chance to make another choice. I was given another chance. Last night, I was at a birthday party for the pastor of St. Andrew Cumberland Presbyterian Church. I came in late because I had a meet with a family over in Midland, but I got to get to the birthday party, and my sister was there. Uh, they attend that church, and her son and her, uh, pa her uh, husband. And so I sat with them mainly during the party and was talking to them, and several people came up that were friends of hers, and uh, they would say, I Edna, he's your brother? And they would say, yes. And they would say, uh, was he really as bad <laughs> as, as what we hear? And Edna would just say, he was worse. My, the, the lady that took care of us as our housekeeper after my mother died when we lived over on 55th Street, I've seen her every once in a while, and I think I've already told you that, that the first time I saw her after I had got back from school and was pastoring at Kingston Avenue Baptist Church, she said, uh, are you Jimmy Braswell? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, you're pastor of that church? And she said, she said yes. And the friend beside me goes, is that surprising to you? And she said, yes. She said, all of them were juvenile delinquents, but he was the worst. <laughs> and I heard it again last night. He was the worst. Well, I got another chance. And that second chance comes with the Lord Jesus given to us. And we all should remember that should remember that forever there is and I may have shared this with you and I'll probably share it many times through the times that I get to share with you as, as your interim pastor there is a house for homeless men located in Amarillo and it was built by a good friend of mine who is a Jesuit priest he and I have been friends and doing lots of things together through the years he was a Jesuit priest to the Southeast Asia before he came back home and so he's a good friend we work with Southeast Asians in Amarillo he built this home right there off I-40 because I-40 has so many transients that will travel through town. It's only for men, this particular one. But I used to never get the name right for it. I'd try to get a hold of him and I'd lost his phone number and so I'd call the operator and I'd say, can you give me the name, or the phone number for Second Chance House? And the operator would say, there's no such place. I say, yes, it is. There is this homeless place for homeless men. It's called Second Chance House. And I want to uh, get the phone number for it. Well, they couldn't find it. Eventually, I'd call another pastor and ask them about it. So finally, I found that priest's number. It was his personal phone, not the, uh, not the house, but the, his personal number. And I called him, and I said, uh, Oh, this is Jimmy. I wanted to talk with you about bringing some supplies over to the house, to, to Second Chance House. And he would say, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. He said, so characteristic of a Baptist. He said, Jimmy, the name of this place is not Second Chance House. The name of this place is Another Chance House. He said, you Baptists just give people a second chance. He said, well, I want you to know we Catholics always give people another chance. I've never forgotten that and always will. We ought to give people another chance. Often if we've had an experience with somebody, we say, oh, they are the same. I bet you Sue has some stories about those seven people that came, that they're a little different from what they were. Their lives are different, either for better or for worse. 
They were a little different because they've all had another chance through life. Thank God that he gives us another chance. Let's bow our heads together as we listen to some music. You have opportunity to respond to Christ today, to let him give you that another chance. Perhaps you as a believer just need another chance because things have just not been going right for you or perhaps in your life you've been dis disappointed and discouraged. In your prayer to him right where you are, ask him to give you a revival in your heart to be revived, to have that another chance to make things work. If you haven't experienced Christ, then I invite you to experience him today, to give you another chance to be the renewed and new person in your heart. You respond to his call, and I'll be here at the front, even as the music plays.